Hey there! In this episode of The Lunarverse, we talk with Dr. Johanna Voss, an astrophysicist at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. We're going to be talking about brown dwarfs and their mysterious heat signatures, the James Webb Space Telescope, which can detect those heat signatures, and we're going to dance around a whole bunch of other cool cosmic topics. And be sure to check out our Patreon, where there's going to be some bonus material about a certain Irishman named Hamilton. Thanks so much for being part of the Lunarverse. Hello! Hi, everybody! Welcome to the Lunarverse! Uh, I'm Dr. Charles Liu, but please, if you're comfortable with it, call me Chuck. Uh, it is such a pleasure to have you all today, and it is always a pleasure to have my wonderful co-host, Alan Liu. Alan, how's it going? It's going pretty good. Okay, good to see you. Thank you so much for everything. And our special guest today, Dr. Johanna Voss. Uh, I will not go deeply into the amazing biography of my colleague, Dr. Voss, but Johanna is pretty awesome in a lot of ways. So hello, and thank you for being here on the show with us today. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I'll tell you what, we're going to start with today's joyfully cosmic cool thing. This was a discovery that's made just recently. Now, uh, Johanna does brown dwarfs. So, uh, going to ask you in a little bit, Johanna, to tell us all about them and what that means and everything like that. But one thing about brown dwarfs is that they don't often, as far as we can tell, appear in binary systems. They do so, but we don't see them like lots and very far apart and things like that because they're small objects. They're relatively light, so they get easily torn away from these dynamical systems. So Imagine our surprise when astronomers discovered a pair of brown dwarfs orbiting one another at a distance of 12 billion miles. That's several times the distance between the Sun and Pluto. And yet these little tiny things are still able to maintain this orbit gracefully hanging out together all this time. I am just amazed at that. I think that is super cool. Uh, Joanna, can you tell us how that happened or or maybe give us a speculation as to you know why these two are still together after all these billions of years honestly i don't know it's it's a little bit of a mystery um mm. and it's it's just one of these serendipitous discoveries we, we don't really know the time scale of how these things fall apart we think it happens quite quickly but then you see these really rare systems in the universe um and i guess and i'm sure this is what the authors are doing but i'm sure the next step is to see how many of them are there in our solar neighborhood and going from there they can start to kind of unravel how long does it take for these things to fall apart um so yeah it's a really exciting paper yeah are you pretty sure well first of all tell us what a brown dwarf is and and are you pretty sure that these two formed together in a binary pair? Or could they have somehow become captured with one another in some strange dynamical dance? Oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah, so brown dwarfs are these really amazing objects. And they're, they kind of bridge the gap between stars, like the sun, like all of the stars you see in the sky, um, and planets, like planets in our own solar system and exoplanets orbiting stars outside our own system, our own solar system. Um, so these brown dwarfs are kind of these weird in-between things. Um, they're not stars, they're not planets, um, there's something in between. Wow. Um, and they're so interesting because of this. They kind of, you know, they defy the rules. You know, we thought, I mean, they were only discovered in 1995. But we thought, you know, stars, planets, scientists were like, oh, we're done. We found everything. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, these like things appeared that were, you know, half and half. So they're, they're really, really interesting. Um, and I'll, study, I'll talk about more what I study later. Um, yeah. But understanding how they form is really, really interesting. Again, since they're halfway between stars and planets, we actually think they can probably form both ways like a wow. star or like a planet oh huh um and unraveling how that happens is very very hard we haven't quite figured out how to do it yet but with this really exciting system we can now run some very sophisticated models to find out how much of every element they're made up of and if they're kind of made of the same amount of each element it probably means they formed out of the same oh. stuff and they Brilliant. probably formed together. 
But if what they're made of is very different, then who knows? Maybe they did kind of meet each other in the middle of the Milky Way. Wow. That makes so much sense. <laughs> if, they're, if they're drawn from the same material, then that means they probably were formed at the same time. I think that's great. But you said that they could be formed either like planets or like stars, which means that planets and stars form in different ways too, right? And that's something yeah. that I think I am you know, sort of clear on, but you're saying that the brown dwarfs are blurring this boundary between what a planet is and what a star is, really. Yeah, totally. So stars form um, in what we call stellar nurseries, um, and they're kind of like these big clouds of gas and dust, and they'll just be kind of accumulating over millions and millions of years in space. Yeah. But eventually, once you have enough gas and dust in a cloud, it'll start to actually collapse. And when that gas and dust collapses, lots of stars form. Um, but brown dwarfs will form if they don't quite get enough mass. So the stars are very, very massive and they get really, really hot and they start burning fuel in their core. That's why they're bright in the night sky. They're burning nuclear energy in their core. But brown dwarfs, they, they form, but they don't quite get big enough. So they're not able to burn anything. So they oh. kind of form and then they just cool down. So it's oh. a little bit of an anticlimax. Um, <laughs> and some some people call them failed stars. It's like if you if you oh. read a textbook, it says that. But we like in my research group, we would say they're more like overachieving planets. <laughs> and they're just super, super exciting. <laughs> it's all in the marketing. Well done. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, and then planets are thought to form kind of after a star forms. So after oh. a star forms, it often gets this, dis this disc around it made of gas and dust and pebbles. And eventually those pebbles kind of coagulate to form planets. Um, and that's kind of like a, that's how you create planets. So it's kind of thought that they, they form after stars. Um, but, but we've just been finding the weirdest systems. We see objects that are very low mass. So they're planetary mass wandering through the Milky Way alone. Hmm. And then we find things that look like brown dwarfs, but they're orbiting a star. And they actually <laughs> look like a planet. And they're the same temperature as a planet, the same size as a planet, but they're very, very massive. And they're actually Whoa. technically a brown dwarf. So like the more weird systems we're finding, and this binary is definitely one of them, the more, you know, those those like exact boundaries we thought we have come up with. Yeah. I think we're just realizing that we don't, you know, nature doesn't care what boxes <laughs> we put things in or what boxes we've like made up. Um, so yeah, I love finding these weird systems. Wow. Uh, Alan, let's take a question. Do we have a question uh, from yeah. the audience? Okay, cool. Yes, yeah, so our first question that we've got is a student question. Okay. Uh, from Nevin or Nevin or Nevan from the Pingry School asks, if you could choose what the James Webb telescope should photograph first, what would it be and why? Aha! <laughs> oh, Joanna, this is right in your wheelhouse. Uh, we're both uh, members of collaborations that have time in the very first go round uh, of the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, tell us about yours and tell us, you know, which one of your objects they should look at first. Yeah, so I am involved in two very exciting proposals with Webb. Mm -hmm. um, and they're both focusing on slightly different things. Um, I guess the first one is focusing on directly image exoplanets wow. or very low mass brown dwarfs orbiting stars because we can't really tell what they are. And then the second program, and this is the one I would, I would hope happens first. Uh-huh. The second program is looking at the coldest worlds outside of the solar system. Um, wow. And these objects are so cold that we literally, we can just about detect them with current facilities. But Webb is the only telescope that can look at them in any detail at all. Oh. And so my object I would choose is a brown dwarf called WISE 0855. Okay. It's the coldest brown dwarfs we know of. 
Um, it has a temperature about the same as the North Pole. Um, <laughs> and, again, and again, it's one of these weird objects. It's, I think its mass is about three times the size of Jupiter. So it's kind of wow. planetary-like. Its size is the exact same size as Jupiter. Uh, but it's just wandering the Milky Way on its own. Um, so it's quite lonely. So I can't wait to look at it <laughs> with that web and say, we're looking at you. <laughs> yeah. Well, when I think of uh, ice planets, right, or uh, maybe an ice brown dwarf or something, I always think of um, uh, Hoth, right, the ice planet in Star Wars Episode Five. I'm sorry, I just do. The ice planet oh, Hoth, man. you know, with Tauntaun <laughs> freezing and stuff like that. I'm sorry. Oh, man. I'm dating myself. But when it first came out, <laughs> it was like, wow. I can't wait to actually find a true ice planet outside our solar system. We know of icy things here on Earth. Mm. Uh, and we know of icy objects out in our own solar system, right? But, but yeah, uh, wow. Okay, so give us that name again so we can remember it and, and find it. It's WISE0855? Yes, that's it. Okay, terrific. I know that your science also involves things like um, the Hubble Space Telescope. You've led projects with that and the Spitzer Space Telescope. And you've even used ground-based stuff too, right? Um, like radio telescopes here on the ground. So you've really done a whole heck of a lot. Tell us a little bit about some of that, uh, the, the technology, the, the science, and, and be, being involved in that aspect of doing uh, astronomy with this new technology, this, these great missions. Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, I'm like, I'm very much an observational astronomer. So I'm always trying to come up with the next great experiment that can tell us about something in the universe that we didn't already know. Um, and I guess my kind of way of doing it would be to like, I tried to come up with a question that either hasn't been asked before or couldn't be answered before. Like maybe we have a new telescope and that's what Webb is doing. Yeah. So suddenly we can kind of ask these questions that we just had no hope of answering because it's this completely new facility um, with an unprecedented sensitivity. We can find things we could never see before. Um, but then we have, like, we have all of these beautiful telescopes on Earth in space, and um, that we've been that we've been using. Um, and yeah, it's so fun. You know, they're like we think of them like toys. We're like, <laughs> what can we do with these things to try and study like our favorite objects? Which for me is brown dwarfs. Um, but all the astrophysicists. Dollars. Yeah, hundred million dollar <laughs> toys, billion dollar toys. Yes, right? very, mean, very expensive. In, in that toys. sense, we we have to thank the taxpayers of the world for for all of this, right? They, yeah. they, yes, the fact that they're willing to support the cool stuff that we're looking for uh, just means that there's some value to it in society, which I think is really meaningful. I think. I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you. Please go on. <laughs> no, no, that's a great point, and it it kind of reminds me like astrophysics can be very different from other sciences because. Mm -hmm. Very few of us can, you know, build a lab and do our experiments with test tubes. We're all, we all have to share the equipment because the equipment is so expensive, so big. Um, so we're all sharing these amazing facilities on the ground and in space. And, you know, I love brown dwarfs, but lots of other astrophysicists are studying all these different things. So yeah. every six months we have this like, it's like a competition basically where we all apply for the telescopes we like we have to lay out what we want to do with them what kind of observations we want and then it goes off to this anonymous panel and um, <laughs> i've sat on a few panels as well and you have to go through them so your proposals are reviewed by your peers it's sometimes it feels like a bit of a lottery but a few a few months later yeah. the lucky proposals are picked out uh, i'm just i just want to say that it wasn't luck I, I know your work <laughs> and how good it is. So sure, there is some aspect of chance, but you know, don't sell yourself short, Johanna. Oh, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I spent a lot of my PhD using a telescope in Chile. I learned to be an astrophysicist using these ground-based telescopes. And mm -hmm. then once I got a little bit more senior, my space-based proposal started going through. And that's when you're really, really excited. Yeah. Because on Earth, you know, on Earth, you have to hope there's no clouds, snow, rain. There's a lot of things that can get in the way of you and the universe. Whereas wow. when you get time 
on a telescope in space, you can just look at anything you want. Whatever, <laughs> <laughs> whatever you know, anything. no big deal. Just just run a telescope out in space. No. <laughs> yeah. so, so nonchalant to describe me when, of course, you know, now your heart is thumping every time it takes another exposure, right? It's, it's, it's an amazing, Absolutely. wonderful feeling. Now, you mentioned the new technology telescope, Joanna. Mm -hmm. I, I know that that's a European facility, right? It's at the European Southern Observatory. Uh, so, so you were doing your dissertation work in a European institution, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So I did my PhD in Scotland at the University uh, of Edinburgh. And then you did your uh, undergraduate work in Ireland. Yeah, yeah. I did my undergrad in my hometown of Dublin. Wow, that's super cool. Um, I, of course, am a product of the United States version of science education. So, you know, I, I have a little bit to say about that. But what, what was it like in the uh, UK at the graduate level and in Ireland at the undergraduate level or even at the high school level? What, what was it like to to like learn schooling in general and science in specific uh, back in those days that way? And um, yeah, that's a good question. I haven't even thought about it in a while because I've been here, yeah. <laughs> working with um, like the American system for a while. Um, but yeah, I have great memories of learning science in Ireland. I remember being like in school, anyway, in high school, there was lots of experiments. It was very practical. So yeah, I think for, you know, in school, I find it very interesting. You learn, you get to choose between biology, chemistry, and physics mm -hmm. when you're about 15. And you can do all three or or you can do none, you, wow. you have a lot of choice. But then in undergrad, I think it's very different to here because I went into a course in Trinity called Natural Sciences. Mm -hmm. And straight away, I kind of had to choose three subjects. I did math, physics, chemistry, and every year I would kind of whittle it down even more. Oh. Whereas anytime I come into contact with undergrads here, they're doing really cool courses. Like, you know, they're doing math, but they're minoring in Russian or they're doing, uh, yeah. you know, and there's all these really cool combinations. Whereas I think for whatever reason, we really kind of were narrowed down a little bit more early on. Huh, um, that's so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I didn't realize it till I, till I came here. Um, and, you know, I mentor a lot of undergrad students and I'm like, Oh, what classes are you taking? And they just say that, <laughs> <laughs> to me, unexpected, but I would love to study those things too. <laughs> yeah. well, well, were there yeah. th was there a subject that like you would have studied in addition to the natural sciences if you had had an opportunity to, you know, sort of like yeah. the way they do general education here? What would you have done? I I would have done English. I mean, I was I always loved science in school, but mm -hmm. you know, when it came to choosing what to do, I was like. English, maths, English, maths. Like I couldn't decide at all. Oh, cool. um, so I definitely wish I could have kept up a little bit of English on the side. Um, just like literature, poetry, novels. Yeah. I just, I love it. And yeah, and honestly, enjoying literature and reading, I think probably makes me a better scientist and a better communicator. So, oh, you know, yeah. just because I dropped, dropped that thing when I was 18 doesn't mean... Um, I, I haven't still used all those skills. Yeah, for sure, right? Uh, never mind the writing of all those proposals to use oh, all yeah. those cool telescopes, <laughs> which is all about like being able to express yourself concisely and effectively. Right? Mm, yeah. yeah. What totally. about like extracurricular activities? Did did you like in college also have to like give up all the things that you would do outside of ordinary coursework? You know, we have clubs and stuff like that all over the place here. It's not the same. Um, yeah, so I, since I was three years old, um, have done ballet. Oh, um, cool. And I did it all through school, yeah, all through college. I mean, it, you know, I was very busy in college, but uh -huh. it's kind of, I knew I couldn't quit it because it's the thing that makes me happy. It makes me who I am. Well, you that's know? fantastic. So I, yeah, I kept doing it and I still do it here. And it just, it's the one thing that just... No matter what I'm, what proposal I'm thinking about, what telescope I'm worried about, yeah. when I'm in that room, I think of nothing else. That's um, so fantastic, yeah. ballet. I really love it. Yeah. There must be something mathematical to that too, right? I mean, uh, I know the concept, although I've never successfully done it, of spotting corners uh, so that when you spin, you don't get dizzy and stuff. That's that's very mathematical and physical, right? Yeah, I, I would say so, and and it's very. I don't know. It's it's 
Ballet is this interesting thing that I think it shares it with astrophysics and that uh-huh. it's really beautiful to watch. It's beautiful oh. to do. <laughs> but at the same time, like it's it's very disciplined and like there are rules you need to follow or else the ballet teacher will let you know. <laughs> um, so I don't know, like maybe when you look out at the universe, you kind of start to appreciate that discipline or those rules. So when I look up at the universe, I'm thinking, what is driving this? beauty that we're seeing and um, what are the rules behind it um, and maybe maybe I'm just wrong maybe there are no rules but we have found some <laughs> no it, yeah. uh, it sounds really cool uh, obviously the the motions of the planets and the stars around us can be thought of as a sort of a cosmic ballet right not to stretch the metaphor too far but there is that dance like quality to the heavens um, and then uh, was it Kepler Alan uh the the harmony of the spheres harmonia mundi and and like all the nestled mathematical stuff yeah so i was just looking up um the music of the spheres idea yeah um, right sort of came out of the ancient greeks first so like the pythagoreans were very into it Uh, but kepler did a lot with it itself is that part was the idea was that like there was like a physical sound that would be created by the the planets moving around Oh. Um, but then it sort of evolved to this like metaphorical idea of like it is the the metaphorical sound of the planets that inspires us all. Oh, I like that. Thank you, Alan, for clearing that up cool. for me. Yeah, because it's this thing that like you hear about. And of course, um, there was actually a uh, a record company that that um, published classical music. It was called Harmonia Mundi Records uh, from a while ago. I don't know if they still exist or if they were bought up by you know one of the big companies like Deutsche Grammophon or something, but. Um, that makes total sense. Thanks, Alan. I appreciate that. So can you please give us another question? Is there another question from somebody sure, else? Sure. We do have another question from another student, Aria, who asked this one. Uh, what would you say to current students who are interested in astronomy? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say that is the most brilliant thing I've ever heard. I had no <laughs> idea astrophysicists were a thing until I was in college. So it's amazing that people so young are so tuned in. Um Like it is really amazing. And I would also say that there are so many ways to get involved with science and with astronomy when you're in high school. I think sometimes people think you have to be this uber genius to do astrophysics where honestly, my, I just think you just want, have to have some passion and want to get your hands dirty. You know, you just want to play with some data. Wow. Um, and there's lots of opportunities out there if you do some research. Um, I, I'm involved in one program um, at the American Museum of Natural History where I work. Uh-huh. Um, and it's called the Student Research Mentoring Program, or SHRIMP, we call it. <laughs> um, so every September, I get three high school students come wow. in. They're from schools all over New York City. We work together all year on a research project. So there's... I'm a mentor. There's about, I think there's 20 mentors. So that means that there's 60 students all together. Wow. Um, some studying astrophysics, some studying, you know, the breadth of the museum subjects. And then, it, and they work so hard all year. And then at the end of the year, they show off their research. And it's always amazing. It's always new. You know, they're looking at new data, doing new experiments, um, finding out things for the first time. Um, and it's really shown me that you know, high schoolers can completely do science. You don't have to wait until something. (laughs) (laughs) Wow, that's really cool. And and even though you are so busy doing your science and the research and all the cutting edge world-class stuff, you still have time for the high school students. Do they do they take away time or do they actually increase your productivity because they're working with you on this project? Yeah, honestly, it it helps me so much as a scientist to have them coming in. They come in twice a week. They are so enthusiastic and so motivated that it's just infectious. When people are so, you know, That's happy great. to be there, it just makes me happy to be there. Um, and yeah, like with them, I can do, I give them their own project. So they're looking at new data no one's ever seen before. And it wow. means that I've set aside this time to work on the data with them. Um, so it's actually a nice way of like getting this side project moving that maybe I wouldn't otherwise have the energy to do. 
Um, but I have these three cheerleaders being like, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Okay. So all of us old folks, we should remember, inject our own science with young people's enthusiasm and energy. And this is not above their heads. Even though they're high school students, they can do this science and they can contribute. And, and you're living proof that that's the case, right? Um, yeah. Uh, Joanna, what's your favorite ballet? Oh, I guess I should ask two different ways. What is your favorite ballet to dance? And what is your favorite ballet mm. to enjoy? Are they the same one? Uh, you know, in the same way that like I, I, of course, I study galaxies and stuff, right? But I also like exoplanets and brown dwarfs fascinate me right now i think you know after looking at big huge things in my own research yeah. i see the little <laughs> things going on and go that is so cool so uh is there actually a split there i think so actually because my i think my favorite ballet to dance would be swan lake ah. it's like it's the you know it's the one when you're five years old and you see the older Ooh, girls yeah. dancing and you're like oh, I want to do that and it's <laughs> you know so classical and so beautiful and you know the the music is literally in my brain and it's going to be there forever <laughs> and you get the gorgeous tutus and it's just like perfect picture perfect ballet but is um, that the one that goes okay it's so yes. and, the di- and the dying swan and everything it's it's uh-huh. just gorgeous um <laughs> but it's fun it's fun you get to pretend to be a swan and it's it's awesome and it's uh-huh. super dramatic as well just, um, <laughs> i mean most ballets are uber dramatic um but when i go to see ballets honestly i i like seeing more modern things um oh. So like I I probably prefer seeing modern ballet. So I go to Alvin Ailey a lot. They have mm. really amazing things. And I guess their oldest pieces would be maybe from the 60s. Um, mm. ah. And then I went, I went to the New York City Ballet recently. And they have, you know, new pieces that were just made um, this year uh, by wow. Justin Peck. So, yeah. Like when I think, I guess before I got into astrophysics, I would have looked at you know, people like me, scientists, and thought those people are the smartest people on earth. But now that I'm one of them, <laughs> I think the best scientists, they're the most creative. Like we're yeah. all, we're all smart. We're all fine. But the people who are <laughs> actually, you know, on the cutting edge of science doing the most exciting projects, they're just thinking outside of the box and um, they're just being creative. Um, and yeah, when I think when you are younger, when you're in school, you're kind of said, oh, you're either going to do science or or you're going to do mm-hmm. art. Mm-hmm. And I think that's just like completely the wrong way to think about it, because if you're a scientist, you really need to be creative. And if you're an artist, I think knowing what's in the universe is obviously going to help you. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think a wide array of skills is, is useful. Well, I don't think there's a better way to end this episode than on that thought. But I wish we could continue talking for more and more time. Uh, we have so much to discuss. Will, will you come back sometime and, and we'll do this again and talk yes, about I, these I would other cool to. things? Especially like <laughs> when your James Webb data come back and you can tell us about the ice planet and see if we can name it Hoth or if we should call it something else. I mean. <laughs> I'll have a word. <laughs> <laughs> How can we keep track of what you're doing? Uh, do you have social media type thing, a web page or something that we can like follow so that we can know what you're doing and, and, and uh, continue to follow the exciting stuff that you're doing over time? Yes, of course. Um, I try to keep my Twitter updated. Um, you can follow me at, at Johanna M. Voss. Okay. Um, otherwise, I have a web page. I don't know what the address is, but if you Google my name, it'll come up. Um, okay. And I keep things up on there too. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And we certainly will absolutely do that. Um, oh, what a, This has been so much fun. I really appreciate it. Dr. Johanna Voss, thank you so much for being with us today. Really, really appreciate it. Oh, I had so much fun. Thanks so much for having me. And Alan, as usual, thank you. Wonderful co-host Meister. Really appreciate it. Yeah, glad to be here. <laughs> and for all of you out there who have been with us, thank you for being part of what we're doing today. If you like what you're hearing and you'd like to support it, please find us on Patreon and we'll do more of this. We'll do as much of this as we possibly can 
for everyone. This has been so much fun. We've had a great time. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for being a part of the Libraverse.